guys. Hello. Welcome back for another episode of The Weekend Hour. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Today we're going to be talking about a case that you might not have heard of, but believe it or not, Linda Hazard, who is the person we're going to be speaking about today, um, was Washington's first female serial killer and I actually did not know this until well I first heard about Linda Hazard when we first moved here in 2013 and I had no clue up until now that she was actually the first serial killer like in how Washington. Many people she killed it's freaking wild I know most of the story takes place in the county we currently live in and it's not a big county at all no so I was pretty shocked that this, one, even had happened, and two, that she was the first female serial killer. It just, like, blows my mind because I've known that about this case for so long that it's just, like... It's, like, literally in our backyard. What? Yeah, it's, like, a 20-minute drive. It's crazy. So, as you can imagine, the story is wild, guys. And it amazes me how much you were able to get away with back in the day. Oh, yeah. Ugh, it's just so crazy. Hashtag and no it's rules. actually quite horrifying. Huh? Hashtag no rules. Just do what you want. <laughs> exactly. So if you're into true crime, serial killers, malpractice, health fraud, I think you might be interested in this one, to be honest. Um, there's also a book that was written by Greg Olson called Starvation Heights. It's a good book. It really goes into detail about Linda and, you know, everything that she did, all her infamous crimes. And um, so if you're really interested in this story, I recommend you go get the book. It's a good book. Um, I'll leave a description. I'll leave a link in the description. There you go. <laughs> Now let's get into it. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, like, comment, or subscribe if you haven't yet so you can be part of the Weekend Hour fam. Now that we got that out of the way, grab a drink, get cozy, and let's get into the, the weekend, weekend Hour. hour. It's probably going to be an hour because we're getting better at it. <laughs> Maybe. Hopefully. So Linda Laura Hazard was born on December 1867 in Carver County, Minnesota. She was the oldest of seven siblings to Susanna Neal and Montgomery Burfield. There wasn't a lot of lo there wasn't a lot of information about her childhood. Understandable, it's the 1800s. Mm -hmm. But when she was 18 years old, she married her first husband and had two children. In 1898, her husband suddenly disappeared. And then abandoned her own children and went on to marry her second husband, Sam Hazard. It's unclear how they met, but it's clear that Sam went to prison for several years after this for bigamy charges because he also had abandoned his previous wife and children, but never filed for divorce. A real winner. Sounds like a super awesome dude right there, right? <laughs> he also had a very successful military career prior to this, but ended up mishandling military funds and went to prison <laughs> awesome way to start a marriage hey, let's right. get married and i gotta go to the pin so yeah it's yeah. just like wow she picked so i think i read he was like there. a west point graduate wasn't he huh? like he was a west point graduate or he was like an army officer if i remember right yeah yeah he was an army officer yeah, yeah. maybe just Go from army officer to prison guy. Yeah, he had a really good, strong career going for him until he freaking blew it. So while Sam was incarcerated, Linda started to study with Dr. Edward Hooker Dewey, who was a physician and a pioneer to the therapeutic fasting and invented the no breakfast plan and went on to write a book about this. It was very popular at the time, but medical experts said absolutely not. This is very inaccurate information. But despite this, it got a lot of people's attention, and fasting kind of took off. I want to say, like, this was in, like, the 1800s. Mm -hmm. They talked about, like, you know, don't eat breakfast. Mm -hmm. And it's, like, it took off then, and it's 2023. 
And they still have and we're like, still talking about it. Like intermittent fat, like don't eat for sixteen hours. You're gonna lose all this weight. It's totally good for you. Mm-hmm. It's like doctors back then were like, no, you guys are wrong. Like you shouldn't do this. But don't get me wrong. I think fasting is fine. I don't yeah. think there's anything wrong with it, to be honest. Like the no break. I don't know. I'm a fatty, so I have to. I think he was just the first to kind of think outside the box. Be yeah. like, everyone has breakfast, and they make you know bacon and eggs and potatoes, and like everyone has this big breakfast. And That's he true. was kind of the first to be like, yeah, I actually don't really yeah. need it. And 150 years later, it's like people are still doing that. That just blows my mind. Yeah. So Linda received very minimal training, as in, I, I read this and I couldn't, as an osteopathic. Osteopathic. Osteopathic nurse, which is someone who believes the root of the problem is within the whole body itself, mm-hmm. not an isolated problem, mm-hmm. and never received a medical degree. But despite this, Linda still opened her own fasting clinic Mm -hmm. in 1902 in Minneapolis. She started right away getting lots of eager patients, and she used her own treatment plan. Her thought was, any illness can be treated, anything from tuberculosis to a small headache. (laughs) 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 Because she believed that what you eat can cause a buildup of toxins in the blood, which can lead to various illnesses. So basically, if you had cancer, MS, it's because of what you ate. (laughs) Yeah. And if you take food away from that, it will deplete the toxins in your blood and you'll be cured. So like, part of me. I can kind of see where she was going with this. But there is no, there was no evidence to back this up. So I'm not even sure where she pulled this out of her butt. Like, I'll be honest, if she said this, like, nowadays... (laughs) <laughs> I could almost believe it. There's so much crap in the food that we eat. That's true. But like in the 1800s. Yeah, like the food I back mean, then, it was like. Super it's, good. It's like from the farm in like two days. Yeah, to, exactly. Or it's bad. At least in my mind. I don't I don't know how food was back then. But to me, it's like. No, it's true. It's she, just a lot worse nowadays. If she was born like nowadays and had all these theories, I'd be like, dude, she's totally right. Like, like I, I've read places like the food that we eat now like definitely causes cancer and things. But well, yeah. And for her to say this one, like. In my mind, the food I was just like think fresh. For her to be like, yeah, you got to starve yourself for months at a time to get rid of whatever illness you're struggling with. Yeah. If it's a toothache or whatever, <laughs> like just starve yourself. It's fine. Nothing will happen to you. <laughs> and I'm sure if you're like bloated, you're not going to be bloated anymore. I just anymore. feel like this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> but it wasn't long until things started to unravel for Linda. Shocker. <laughs> Rumors started flooding the town because of a very suspicious death. One of Linda's patients died under her care. The autopsy showed she was starved to death and the coroner wanted her prosecuted. But shocker, they found out she didn't have a license. So they couldn't do anything about it. They couldn't hold her accountable. Like I've read that it doesn't make any sense to me. Like, can you starve this person? Mm-hmm. But because you're not a doctor, it's fine. Like you said, the laws back then and everything were just a lot more. We'll go into it a little bit later just about the law, but yeah, I know it's every time really I read backwards. it, it like, just it makes me mad. The detectives also noticed this patient had no valuables on her. Her purse, rings, and other jewelry were missing. When the detectives came back to her home to ask her about this, she was gone. (laughs) I'm out. She booked it. This was the same time her husband got out of prison. So in 1907, they took off to Washington State to start over. But I believe that they were here specifically because of the new law that they granted alternative medicine practitioner licenses without having to have a medical degree so basically if you're all like i'm moving to washington state i'm here i'm a alternative medicine practitioner um you didn't have to have a medical degree to get a license which just boggles my mind i'll leave it to washington to be like even a hundred years ago was like Oh, you want to come out here and do some, like, non, like, regular thing? Come on, bro. Right? Like, we welcome all kinds yeah. of Yeah, like, we were one of the first few life. states that was like, oh, you want to get high to serve all this stuff? Yeah, do it. Let's go. 
<laughs> you know, like alternative yeah. medicine, like leave it to Washington. Leave it to Washington to be like, yeah. Oh, you've you've kind of practiced medicine and took care of people and starved them. That sounds reasonable enough to get a license. I mean, <laughs> you're doing it out of the kindness of your heart. And we're all about peace, baby. <laughs> That's why the flag is green. <laughs> really? <laughs> think we were saying the flag is green yeah that's funny okay <laughs> get back to the series they ended up purchasing a 40 acre property in a town called olala washington this town is across the puget sound from seattle in a rural area heavily forested not a lot of people in this town and it's still like that for the majority part it's also just a quick ferry ride to seattle the property was named Wilderness Heights. Wilderness Heights. The locals name it Starvation Heights, if you didn't get the clue on the book. but <laughs> um, It had existing small cabins on it, and eventually Linda wanted to, to build her own dream sanitarium. But that was going to take years to build and lots of money. So she decided she would treat patients in her cabins on her property and if those were full she would put up patients in seattle hotel rooms <laughs> she was dedicated yeah she couldn't come to my place oh i don't have a place i'll find a way to don't worry ruin your I'll life get you a place so her regiment included daily enemas that would last for hours mm. up to 12 quarts of water a day she would give them very little food the third part of her treatment was a quote-unquote massage, but in no means was this enjoyable or relaxing. <laughs> she would clench her fist and punch you many times in the forehead and the back. Like, why the forehead? Like, maybe, like, the sinuses or something? Maybe. Well, like, I'm just picturing, I was like... I just, like, wondering, like, why the freaking forehead? Rattle their brain? Like, like what is it? <laughs> reading about this, and they basically said that she would just basically beat them. Yeah. Like, oh, you have this knot in here? Let me just kind of... Right? Like a psychopath. Yeah. Oh, you are you have this problem going on in your intestines? It's like she would take out a bunch of anger out on her patients. Let me just elbow you in it to knock it away. You know, loosen <laughs> it up, the toxins. Let me just knock you unconscious for a minute <sighs> so you don't remember. Like, I've got some, like, you know, hard massages. It's to a point, you're like, <laughs> it feels so good, <laughs> you know? Reminds me of like a chiropractor. <laughs> oh, they're so good. You can't knock the chiropractors. Actually, a chiropractor is kind of like an osteopathic thing. They believe, you know, if you have this problem, it's in the body. And so they try to. Yeah. There's some problems that I feel like a chiropractor can fix, though. No, I do agree. I'm just like giving that as an example okay. of like someone good. who thinks of the whole body instead of. Okay. Just where it's at. So Linda also wrote a book called Fasting for the Cure of Disease in 1908, which brought in her first patients. In the book, she basically claims she's a doctor with years of research and experience. And she claims if you starve yourself for months at a time, you will regain your health back. <laughs> what this a load of This method crap. attracted people who were free thinkers and what is it, babe? Theosophists. The do I can't do it. <laughs> I've tried. Oh, <laughs> theosophists. Theosophists. Sophists. Free thinkers and theosophists. Yep. <laughs> or it's theo. Or it's theosoph. We're going to just quit the word up, and you guys can say it however you want to. <laughs> it's up for <laughs> interpretation. <laughs> so this attracted her first Washington patient, Daisy Maud Haugland, a Norwegian woman who, whose immigrant parents once owned Alki Point, which, if you don't know, is the original settlement in which later formed Seattle. So very wealthy people. In fact, all of her patients were pretty wealthy 
at least the ones that we know about and the ones that she tried to find. Linda ended up convincing Daisy to join her treatment plan. Um, allegedly, Daisy had stomach cancer and felt that the medicine she was taking wasn't doing anything, and modern medicine was just in its baby stages, so she was desperate to try anything. After a 50-day fast, she died on February 26, 1908, at the age of 38. She left behind a three-year-old son, Ivar. Side note. He actually went on to open up a very successful and famous seafood restaurant in Seattle that is a staple around here. Yeah, Ivar's Seafood Restaurant. Yeah. yeah. Like, talk about, like, I lost my mom at three Coming up. To a psychopath yeah. serial killer, but Starved. went on to do no. What good if like things. my mom starved to death? I'm gonna make a restaurant to not just to feed a bunch of people. Makes so much sense now. Just poop. After Daisy's death, people became very concerned about her methods, understandably. <laughs> but per the autopsy, Daisy suffered from stomach cancer, and it's possible that that's how she died. So everybody kind of moved on. And even Daisy's husband defended Linda, saying, well, she did have cancer, so there's basically no proof that, you know, she was actually starved to death. (laughs) Just sure. Blows my mind. Sure. So patients continued to see Linda. Ida Wilcox checked in for 47 days and died on September 26th. Then Violet Heaton in March, Blaine B. Tyndale in June, both died. This is when people started realizing what may be happening here, but according to the Seattle health director, there was literally nothing he could do because people allowed themselves to be put in Linda's care. Even though these people would still be alive if it hadn't been for Linda, there was still nothing he could do unless it involved children. This is like... This is where, like, BS flags raise for yeah. me. Because it's like... So you were to see a doctor in a hospital, and if he overdoses you on morphine, what, they would say the same thing? Well, you volunteer to be in his yeah. care. I'm thinking of, like, okay, nowadays, yeah, like, malpractice and stuff, but... Like back then, it's like, hey, doctor, I have this ache in my, my ankle is kind of sore. And he's like, we got to chop it off. And he just chops you off right then and there. And like you die because you bleed out. But they're like, oh, nope. You went to see him about your ankle. Like, not our That's problem. That's what I mean. Like, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. Me. Like, maybe it's because it's such a rural area. They're just like, we can't. We don't know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> she has more money than the town. I don't know. So, Mrs. Maud Whitney died shortly after that. Then 24-year-old civil engineer Earl Edward Erdman. I don't know why that one takes me for a loop. It's a tongue twister. It's better than I Earl Edward Erdman. That one's hard. Was in search of a physician because of his severe indigestion. So he went to Hazard, and she claimed her treatment, of course, would help. And then he died of starvation three weeks later. Oftentimes, she would conduct her own bathtub autopsies. So she would always claim they died of something else. But when someone else would do the autopsy, they died of starvation. Like, of course you're going to be like, oh, yeah, he had, like, this thing on this... He had limb. liver failure. Yeah. Not that Randomly. He's 70 pounds. Undiagnosed. You know? Goodness. So, whenever someone checked into Wilderness Heights, they always had to leave all their jewelry and any valuables with her, even wedding rings. She also ripped out any gold teeth after they died. <laughs> and the patients were in a starving, delirious mind. She would convince them to give her their savings. And properties in their wills. She's just a sicko. In 1909, Eugene Walkins' body was found in Linda's property. He was the only person that was found that didn't starve to death. He was actually shot in the head and discarded down a ravine on her property. 
1911, a wealthy Englishman checked into Wilderness Heights and died after 53 days. His family was left $70 to live off in his will. And guess who got the rest? Hmm. Linda. All this money went to fund her quote-unquote dream sanitarium where she could conduct her business in full scale. Linda was also making the headlines in the newspapers all over Washington. Headlines like, Woman, MD, kills another patient. But despite the bad press, she had a health she had a lengthy list of wealthy willing participants that kept on coming. So Frank Sillard, a lawyer, C. A. Harrison, a publisher of the Alaska Yukon magazine, also died just a few weeks after they checked in. When Ellsworth Radar, who was a publisher for Sound Waves magazine and former legislator legislator started withering away in, under Linda's care, she had him put up at the Outlook Hotel. When visitors tried to come and talk to him, convince him to leave, he was all but declined. Then, out of pressure, Linda Hazard moves him from one un- secret location to another, where eventually the nearly six-foot-tall man died, weighing less than 100 pounds. Like, you know... They're like brainwashed, like, I can't leave. No, yeah. this is taking they time. They were definitely. Like, they were scared out of their minds, like, mm-hmm. literally getting starved and beaten. Mm-hmm. But, like, the psychological stuff that there was going on. And she knew what she was doing, man. Oh, yeah. I mean, Absolutely. Beat and then. Let me rob you. If you want to eat Take today, your gold tea. sign this in my will. Oh, yes. Right. Pick up the pen. I can't. Like. I know. Gosh, man. It's so disturbing. Like. Family and friends of the patients are astounded by the fact that these people wouldn't leave. They claim it's because of Linda's overwhelming presence and loud personality that convinces them to come and then mentally torments them to obey, which obviously leaving is disobeying it's absolutely sick and twisted there's to be an estimated 40 people that may have died in linda's care but there's more to be suspected because she did have an incinerator installed later on on the property (laughs) linda was eventually caught and prosecuted because of two british sisters claire and dorothea williamson Clara and Dorothea were wealthy, healthy, and young, and they saw an advertisement for Linda's book, Fasting for the Cure of Disease, in a Seattle newspaper while staying at a luxury hotel in British Columbia. They quickly ordered the book and got hooked. Even though they were healthy, they were known to be quite the hypochondriacs and wanted to try it basically <laughs> bored out of their mind with unlimited yeah. funds what what could what could possibly go wrong let's what do this new trend and try to get even healthier and new diet yeah they want to the say like setters for the new fad <clears throat> i've been kind of thinking about this too is i feel like there's so many people have come here and died i feel like there's got to be some like onesie twosies probably the ones that we don't hear about like somebody came in for like a month and they did, you know, basically starve to death for a month. They survived and then started eating healthy and got their life together. Like, maybe we're okay. Like, there's got to be at least a couple because why would everybody just keep on coming back? Well, because she's saying that they all died of something else. You know, yeah. they check in because they have something wrong mm-hmm. with them. And she will claim that this will fix it. But in the end, she'll be like, oh, no, it was too far advanced for fasting to cure yeah so maybe these people just kind of are thinking on the positive side of like well maybe my illness or whatever i'm dealing with isn't too far advanced i think this should work i don't know that's just my theory i think it's got to be but i i did not read that there was any successful patients so i don't know um They didn't tell any family members what they were about to do because they were afraid they would get talked out of it. 
super smart. <laughs> they were so excited to go to this luxury, experienced treatment center. But Linda told them that the clinic wasn't ready yet. So in February 1911, she put them up separately in the Seattle Buena Vista apartments. Linda would feed them twice a day with canned tomato broth, accompanied with enemas that gave them excruciating pain for hours, followed by the violent massages that would leave them battered and bruised. She then talked about leaving their jewelry, diamond rings, and deeds to their estate in her office for safekeeping. Yeah. Like, I, I, I don't again. I don't know what it's like at the turn of the century, but like, hey, I need you to show up, but you also need to bring like uh, your will and <laughs> the deed to your, your estate in order for me to check you in. Like yeah. nowadays, you gotta show up with like an ID, but like, she was like, oh, I don't. I can't tell if you are who you are. You need to show up with your will and the deed to your estate, and then you can come to my oh, luxury you're a clinic. hypochondriac. Well, you never know what might pop up, so yeah. give me the deed. <laughs> you know, it's just like it just baffles me that the, then they. It just baffles me that then they would do it. I mean, like, it's like how desperate are you? And you're starving and beat for a month, like, you know. No, like when they're first signing up. That's what I'm saying. Like, who just like brings their deed with them you know that's what that's what blows my mind hole yeah but so by april the sisters were in really bad shape so delirious signing paperwork that gave linda a monthly stipend of 25 pounds of sterling which in u.s dollars equates to 30 dollars which in today's money is about 969 dollars this was given to linda every month to the hazard institute and added, in case of death, the sisters were to remain under Dr. Hazard's care for cremation. <laughs> so, I'm going to treat the them. Fine print. <laughs> and when they die. Yeah, that, she's already basically claiming that they're going to die. Yeah, I don't want somebody else to do an autopsy. I will tell you why they died. I'm going to do the autopsy. And you're after they die, I get to choose what to do with them i'm gonna cremate them i'm gonna bury them i'm gonna do whatever i want to do it's just like like who it's just crazy so somehow we don't really know for sure was whether it was a neighbor security but somehow one of the girls snuck a telegram to their childhood nanny in sydney australia basically summoning summoning her for the rescue the nanny mrs conway left right away, taking a week by boat to get to them. On June 1st, when Mrs. Conway got to Linda's office, she was shocked to see Linda wearing one of Claire's favorite silk gowns and a hat. Can you imagine, like, showing up, and you're like, I'm here to rescue these girls, and the person that walks in is literally wearing her clothes? Wearing her clothes. You'd be like... Yeah, no, I know you can't afford this Louis Vuitton. Yeah. <laughs> these how, Gucci... How are you... What? He's so imagine showing up, and then the person walks in, and then you're told that Claire has passed away to to cirrhosis of the liver, and would die regardless of fasting or not. Like, does she not? Like, does she just like come up with? Oh, she has cirrhosis of the liver, and has like n she doesn't yeah. have to like prove that this was like. That's how she died. No, does she not have to prove that this was? you know, showed up in many of her health checkups. Like, she could just be like, oh, no, she died of cirrhosis of the liver. But obviously that's not, like, a very fast way to die. Yeah. So wouldn't other doctors, like, notice that? She would have symptoms, Again, you it was, know? It was in her will of she's going to do my autopsy, and that's the end of that. So Dorothea was moved to her property in Iwawa, and she fell insane, quote-unquote. Miss Conway went to the morgue to look at Claire's body and to see if it was even her. She was taken back by how much weight she had lost. She was completely unrecognizable. <clears throat> when she went to go visit Dorothea, she just saw a complete skeleton that was too weak to walk. Normally, the patients are separated, but this day, because of the 4th of July, which 
is a month later. Yeah, I'm not. They sure got why. to quote unquote celebrate. I mean, to like, if I had to guess, the lady was like trying to stall her. Yeah, you can see her. We can't. You, but no, you can't. Oh, you can see. No, wait. You gotta wait. You gotta wait. Oh, like the month long. Yeah, like that's why it took a month giving between giving her a bunch of yeah. run around. Like, I'm sure the ferry runs more than once a month. For a trip, <laughs> yeah, you know. Right. Like. So was she just like hanging out in town for a month? I guess. That's crazy. It's a rich nanny. Um, at that point, two patients came to the nanny, and begged her to help them. S- help them saying that they were prisoners and they were dying. As Conway, the nanny, took all of us in, she realized she needed to get Dorothea away from here. But Sam Hazard said, Nope, we have guardianship over Dorothea, and she will be with us until the day she dies. Who says that? Like, I feel like he wasn't even trying to, like, be inconspicuous or... Yeah. Like oh no, just she like, is oh, ours. Oh no, she's ours. She's gonna stay with us. We have the paperwork. She's gonna die soon, so you know, bid your farewell. <laughs> it's like it's so messed like, up. How cruel are you? Just like after she already know. looks like a like, skeleton. I'm gonna slowly like, kill these people. Ugh, it's so oh sick. So Conway was absolutely Conway absolutely knew something was very wrong, and rang. Her, their uncle, who lived in Portland, Oregon, to rescue them. He immediately came, was forced to pay the hazards the girl's bill, quote-unquote. When he got Dorothea, she weighed only 60 pounds. 60, like my child He went to rescue her. Didn't call police. He just paid the bill. (laughs) What? Oh my gosh. It was like two thousand dollars, which you know, in today's money, it's, it's like, like obscene amount of money. Like even nowadays, and he just $2, paid $2. it. I mean, I guess like you don't want to try to like get the get them involved. upset or anything, yeah. or maybe to make the situation worse. Maybe he was just like, "I'm just gonna pay it, mm-hmm. just get her out of there, and then we'll deal with." Definitely the seems like what happened. So the Tacoma Vice Consul put pressure after this on Kitsap County to prosecute her, but they just couldn't afford it. (laughs) Dorothea, though, wasn't going to let her get away with it. She volunteered to pay the money to prosecute her. In August 1911, Linda was arrested. In 1912, her trial began. Nurses and servants told the jurors everything about the amount of pain they were in, crying all night long. They couldn't sit because they were so skinny that it physically caused them pain. They received baths that were scalding hot. They also gave them the forged checks, the letters, power of attorneys, forged wills to their states. Like they gave them everything. Like, so the judge kind of knew right away that Linda was a con artist. But despite this, the jurors felt sympathy towards Linda, and she ended up only getting charged with manslaughter. It's possible that the jurors gave her sympathy because she was a woman and she was just trying to help these people. Maybe things just got out of hand i don't know why they were feeling sympathy for her that's just what i read i i could be totally wrong yeah i mean i think i think we read too like talked about she was saying that oh these people are just against me because i'm thinking outside the box and i have this Mm -hmm. new alternative stuff and the mainstream is trying to come at me you know when i have these new revelations of how to treat cures and i'm a woman so that's why people hate yeah, me. Yeah, she definitely played that sympathy card. Mm-hmm. Like, that's sick. But. So there was also a group of people in New Zealand that believed in her and petitioned for her release. And the Washington governor agreed and released her from prison only after two years. 
as long as Linda and her husband moved to New Zealand and they revoked her medical license and was basically like, I don't want to take care of you here anymore. I don't want to pay for you. Our tax dollars don't want to go to you. Like, you move over there. (laughs) It blows my mind of, like, imagine just having enough followers to be like, let her out. Let her out. And the guy's finally just like, look, I'm tired of dealing with this crap. Yeah. Like, get out of here. Leave the country. Go be with your crazy people. (laughs) Starve together. You know? (laughs) Like... The 1900s were wild. I know. They kind of just, like, do their own thing. Yeah. I'm tired of getting all these mail. Protesters. and yeah. Not even, like, I'm tired of reading all these things all day. All the mail. <laughs> all the mail's coming in. <laughs> I got to read 14 pages a day. This is bullshit. <laughs> Get her out of here. <laughs> you know? So that's the kind of crap I'm thinking in my head of like, yeah, fine. I'll... Oh, I'm sure they were doing all kinds of weird stuff back then. Yeah, and also, okay, I don't know how New Zealand is, but I feel like it's they're, they're like the Washington of over there. The... Linda and Sam thrived in New Zealand, where she worked as a doctor. <laughs> And published yet another book about fasting and her cure and went on to kill many more people. However, once New Zealand found out about her license, that it had been revoked, they charged her, fined her, and kicked her out. But no joke. This is what gets me, though. She'll kill these people. But oh wait, you don't have a medical license? Okay, now you gotta get you yeah. gotta get out of here now. It's just like it's like what? Don't charge her for the people she was killing, but charge I, her because she had her license revoked. It's gonna sound dumb, but I feel like it's like you're like oh screw you, like yeah, you definitely killed that guy. You know, yeah. like, no questions. But you like slowly over like a month or two. Like, oh, they died. Yeah, I don't know. I was just trying to help them out. Yeah, but she even shot that guy in the head. Okay, yeah. And still nothing happened. Like, what? That one, yes, she should have got. Like. But I don't think they have, like, ballistics like we do now. But, like. But he was still on her property. Agreed. But they're not going to have, like, CSI in her backyard in 1907. Like, hmm, let me see. Like, (laughs) you know, does a bullet come from one of these guns? I can't tell. They're just like, did you shoot him? No, I didn't shoot him. I don't know. I okay. think it was like a hunter too stumbled upon him. Yeah. But like ah oh man. The nineteen hundreds were so So the wild. crazy part of this story is that after she left New Zealand, she came back to Olala. <laughs> <laughs> With open arms, apparently. I don't know I honestly don't know why she was allowed back here. If but I she had, was. If I had to guess, it was long enough to where, like, the governor and the people that, like, sent her away. Maybe they didn't know she was in New Zealand. I don't know. Yeah, probably didn't know. But anyway, she came back, and uh, she came back with a vengeance and uh, lots of money. She finally built her dream sanitarium, but because her license was, was revoked, she had to call it School of Health. And went on to treat many more patients. And now, there was a lavish autopsy room in the basement and a crematory. After 15 years of this, in 1935, the School of Health burnt down to the ground. Thank goodness. Ironically. Like, (coughs) hallelujah. And we're not really sure how it happened, if she was trying to cover things up, if a patient maybe escaped um, or set fire to it to escape. Like, no one really knows. I hope somebody escaped and then came back and was like, F this place. (coughs) Burn it to the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, like. Well, didn't you think a guy that got shot on her property was a patient that escaped? That was, like, my first theory was, like, yeah. why did he get shot? Because he managed to, to get out away. and he was trying to run away and, like, tell people. And they were, like, no. Oh, crap. 
Because then we live in the middle of nowhere. Just throw them in this ravine. And I think, too, because it was, like, such a huge ravine that there might actually have been others that were thrown over the ledge. Um, but this is the crazy part. If that wasn't all crazy to you, <laughs> it gets a little weird. So after this school of health burned down, Linda started to feel ill. So she followed her own regimen. A few weeks later, she starved to death. I can't make this shit up. My mind is like, how have you not done this before? To like, I think she was trying so hard to make people believe that she didn't kill these people. Yeah. And if if I just suck it up, and and do it and do it, I can prove to them like I didn't do it. Yeah. Thing is, like, I think it was trying her trying to prove. I feel like she should have done this a long time ago, like when she was like, you know. Hey, I'm in my 30s. I'm in good health. Yeah, let me just like, quote unquote, do it. But like, not really mm-hmm. starve myself. But I'm definitely going to lose a bunch of weight. Mm-hmm. And come back. Like, yeah, I'm so rejuvenated. Definitely works, you know? <laughs> like, that's how you're going to get some people. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah. I, did you do this, doctor? Yeah, I just did it. Like, look, here's the pictures, you know? Mm-hmm. I was like this. I got down to this skinny. And then I came back. <laughs> and now look at me now. I'm just like rough and tough. She was already skinny to, be- you know what like, saying? to begin with. So. But when you do it and you're like 70. Like, oh, let me just not eat for a month. Yeah, you're gonna die. Yeah. I can barely get around like skipping two meals. <laughs> but then it makes me wonder, like, did Sam move back with her? Did he just like let her just wither away? Or was he like supporting her, like, yeah, no food for you? <laughs> like, I'll give you the massages, don't worry. Yeah. This is for your own good. I'll put those enemas up there. Like, you know? no problem. I got your Gosh. back. You know? I just Make sure you wonder, because you don't hear anything about what he did or, you know. <laughs> Maybe he died because he tried to do it in Australia. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. So it's unclear exactly how many people fell victim to her outrageous lies. But we're just glad that she got a taste of her own medicine at the end. Like, oh. Literally. Literally. Well, actually, <laughs> she didn't get a taste because she couldn't eat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she just, you know, got a a little tomato broth of her own taste. Own, <laughs> you know what I'm trying to go a with teaspoon. this. A teaspoon. Here's a teaspoon of your own medicine. Yeah. So start, the Starvation Heights, as the locals call it, did have a small cemetery nearby. Apparently, this was before the incinerator or the crematory. And she buried bodies and put a small headstone there. But once she died, it became abandoned and vandalized. It's very, it's not easy to access, but that didn't stop us. Pictures insert here. Dun, dun, dun. Right? It is said to be a haunted cemetery and listed on many paranormal sites. So, we are going to take a look for ourselves, obviously during the day, because I'm paranoid about these things. (laughs) And luckily for us, we'll put our clip in. We'll put a little clip. So, thoughts. Like, what are your thoughts overall? Let's just. I don't know. My thought is she's a whack job. And I can't believe that there was no law against scamming people and tricking them into a cure that wasn't true. Even just, the health professionals were like, no, you cannot be doing this to yeah. people. But yet they allow it. And in the end, you know, they know for sure 40 people had died. But they have no idea how many in New Zealand. They have no idea when she came back for those 15 years how many people she killed because she had that crematory. Mm-hmm. So there's no saying how many people she killed and it just baffles me that she got away with it for so long she went to prison then got released and she was allowed to come back and do the same 
crap? Like, dude, the 1900s are wild. What? Like, there's, like I said, hashtag no rules. Like, how do you, like, how I do just you do don't that? get it. He thought that she was safe enough to live among society again? Like, go to New Zealand. Yeah, I did my time in New Zealand, so I'm going to come back. And then, how did nobody, I think, okay, this is theory, right? Is when she came back, she realized that, hey, I can't go for like this, the higher ups, you know, it's the street people that have all the money. You got to get that like middle tier. Hey, I'm not poor. I'm not rich, but I'm like, I got a little bit of money <laughs> and stuff. Yeah. And I need these things. Well, because you can see not that gonna... she goes to New Zealand and makes a crap ton of money, right? Because yeah. now when she comes back to Alala, she has all this money now. She can build this dream sanitarium. So it makes you wonder, what was she doing that she was making so much money? And it just, like... Okay. Two theories. One, she went to New Zealand and was like, okay, maybe we can't, like, start from two months to, like, a month, right? People would come to her, and then they're feeling crap. Beat him up, blah, blah. And then she would nurse him back. And like, oh, I felt so great. Yeah, definitely go to her. She made money. Probably not what happened. What probably happened is she went to New Zealand and, like, got the rich people, but they weren't, like, super rich. Like, figured out the con that she needs to do back here. Right? Hey, I got in trouble in the States for the rich people. Let me go to New Zealand and not do, like, the rich, but, like, my followers slash the middle class figured mm-hmm. out where her con was, like mm-hmm. narrowed it down, got the money, and was like, peace out, Cub Scout, and then went back to America, and that's how she played out the rest of it. Because she'd like, she fine tuned her con in New Zealand mm-hmm. to where, I mean, here's this cool uh, invention. I think it just goes to say, like, these trends, you know, these diet fads. Have been around for a long time. Oh, this was in 1907, 19, like the turn of the century. Now it's 2023. Yeah, and it's and I just feel like they're so dangerous because we don't have a lot of information about it. Yeah. And it just kind of goes to show you that you could be li- literally just this quack job and people are going to do it. Yeah. yeah. These diet fads and things that you said. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just goes to show how freaking gullible people are. Yeah. And if you slap the term doctor on there, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, guaranteed to have followers. Yeah. It's just so scary. But anyways, what do you guys think? Do you guys think she was a quack job? Do you guys think that she was just doing it out of wanting to help people because she had a heart of gold? <laughs> I can't even see it with a straight face. Let us know what you guys think. What your thoughts? I mean, it's just beyond her time. She knew about you know, dieting is good for you. I mean, like, there's nothing wrong with dieting, but the fact that you're like starving them and then beating them to death. <laughs> okay, I try to keep it in too. <laughs> Could it? Like you just can't spin yeah. it into a good way. The one that lost me was, like, they're missing their gold teeth. Like, okay, somebody died in your like, oh, man, I'm so sorry. And then she's like, <coughs> so sorry, Barry, throw him in the ravine. You know, like. I need this for my sanitarium one day. That's when I knew, like, you're a freaking crip, bro. Like, you're, you're a psychopath. You're really pulling out their gold teeth. <laughs> like, okay, maybe, like, hey, you need to keep your, your jewelry in this lockbox because you're going to go through some times where you're just like, oh, crap, I'm starving, blah, blah, blah. I don't want you to hurt yourself. Okay, I can see that. You ain't getting me to take my will. But, like, take it and you're like, hey, here, I need your will. I need your deed. I need all this stuff, and I'm going to keep it. Like, you're welcome. I don't know. And when you die, I want to take your teeth. (laughs) It's in the fine print. (laughs) Right. But, like I said, let us know what you think. Yeah. I think she was a crook, but that's for your own Me to judge. You judge however you want. All right, guys, <laughs> we'll see you for our next video. Stay tuned. Have a good night.
<laughs> Crap, I should have took my allergy medicine. 